Hey everybody, welcome to Artists in the Spotlight. Um, I'm very excited today for our episode number five. I got a special guest that um, in his own right is a rock star in the world of uh, <laughs> in the world of rock and roll. We got Mr. Michael Beck. How you doing, Michael? I'm good, man. Thank, Thank you. Um, so, as I mentioned, he's the lead singer from um, Kings of Dust. And um, I've been reading a lot online about trying to figure out what you are. And um, a lot of people say you have a 70s influence. And I agree with that. Good. But I also... <laughs> see some 80s influence sure. in there too and um you know um it's a really unique sound different Thank you. I, I really liked it um who are the members of kings of dust kings of dust is um it's made up of uh greg chason a uh, bass player who used to play with uh, Badlands with Jakey Lee, if you remember them, mm -hmm. from back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and uh, Jimmy Taft, who's our drummer, who used to be with a band called Surgical Steel way back in the day. And Ryan McKay, who is our guitar player, who used to be uh, in a band called Crash Street Kids. And then me. So we're all, you know, products of that 70s, 80s feel. So, I mean, it wasn't a, a purposeful thing that the record came out that way, mm -hmm. but we all kind of knew what it was going to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's definitely a 70s-based feel. Um, the band as a whole, I mean, just the way we write is pretty 70s. Mm -hmm. Going after a more 70s sound here in the studio um, was a bit more of a purposeful thing, but... Again, it's um, it's something that would have happened either way. I mean, I I, I, I doubt we're going to come out sounding like in excess anytime soon. So <laughs> that's funny. When was the band formed? Well, uh, we did the record about uh, I think it's been about a year and a half ago. But Greg and I um, have been, you know, kind of tooling around with some of these songs. Um, for eight years so um it's something that um that we've we kind of went through a couple drummers we went through a couple guitar players trying to find the right fit and definitely found the right fit and uh moved from there yeah. so you said it was released about a year and a half ago well it the band was about a year and a half two years ago okay. um in in this inception but the record was uh, which is available now on uh, it, it's in most record stores. Zia uh, here in Phoenix has it. Um, most of your local record stores will have it. It's it's released through uh, Vanity Music Group and Sony Music, so it's available in most record stores um, on CD. But uh, it was released actually March thirteenth. Yeah, so when I looked for it, I, I went to Zia's and I couldn't find it. Some of them were sold out, yeah. so, and it's... I ended up going on Amazon. Oh, and you can get it on yeah. Amazon. Yeah. And you can also get it through uh, our website, which is kod.band. Okay. As far as the band, what's your writing process? Um, Obviously, you do lyrics. I do the lyric and melody for the most part. Um, uh, Greg and the rest of the band, uh, Jimmy and Ryan, all, we all kind of start with a riff and then flush it out. Um, Greg kind of acts as producer, um, as far as in the studio and as far as, um, arrangement. He's really good at arrangement. So, um, the, and I'm sure that's another reason why the 
70s influence is so heavy. Greg is very 70s influence. So it's, uh, it, I'm sure that's a big reason why it comes out. But then um, we kind of, like we said, we start with the riff. We continue to uh, flush the riff out as they're playing. I'm writing melody, and then I usually write lyric based on that melody. So you were getting ready to go on tour. You had yeah. some tours ready to go and plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this coronavirus hit. Right. Tell us a little bit about what that must have well done to your... It blew them up. <laughs> yeah. It blew our plans up. So we've, uh, yeah, we were, um, you know, we released this on March 13th, which was perfect timing. <laughs> so we kind of got swept up in the whole thing. Um, we, uh, we had already released a single um, and a video for a track called Like an Ocean. That was our first one. We released that in January um, and then released the, the record um, in, I think it was May. We released our second uh, lyric video for a track called Yeah, That's Me. Um, and we were planning on doing another video um, that would have been released, you know, probably by now for a track called What's the Other. That's still going to happen, but it's probably going to happen a little later on in the year. Um, we had some plans of, of uh, touring through Oklahoma and Texas, and we had, you know, a couple of guys are, that were helping us to uh, promote some shows out there, and we were putting some string tours together, and, and yeah, that all went blown up, yeah. and then we were going to. There was also some talk of us going to Europe and doing some festivals out there, and uh, even Japan, and... Um, I was uh, pretty excited about that, and that means I'm pretty let down also. So, yeah, it, it kind of blew it all up. We're, now we're looking at, we kind of switched gears because there wasn't any reason to keep going over a set that we can't play for anybody. So we kind of switched gears here about a month ago, and we started writing. So we're about uh, six, seven songs into the second record, which I think we're going to track probably this fall. Um, and then it should be out spring of next year, and then we'll have two records to tour on. So I don't think we're being the, I don't think we'll be the only band in that position, yeah. but. <laughs> as far as a band, I mean, I, I watched you guys on some of your videos that you do, and yeah. you guys seem like you have a great, pers you know, personalities, great bond together. He looks like Greg Chason's a little jokester, and he's he's a bit of a wild card, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it must be a, a good feel with the band when you're it's, working together. And I, I mean, it's it's really, <clears throat> um, and I've been really fortunate throughout my career that I've played with some really great musicians, and um, but this is the camaraderie in this band is is better than I've experienced in a long time. Um, you know, we're all kind of on the other side of, of uh, you know, chase and tail 24 hours a day. And, and we've all had, uh, you know, kind of careers in our own right um, up to this point. So it wasn't, uh, when we got together and started writing, it just, it's a very egoless band. Um, everything is for the concept of the song. It's not about the guitar solo. It's not about the drum fill. It's not about the vocal melody. It's about the song. And everything is, is based on that. And, you know, I'm, 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 uh, we have been ecstatic about the, uh, the response that the record has gotten. It's got some great reviews, better than we even thought. Um, but at the same time, we, we really like the record, so we're, we're glad other people do too. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So let's talk about some of the songs on the album. Most band members probably don't like this question, but do you have a favorite song? No, no. I don't. Yeah. And that's why they don't like it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I have, and I, I don't know if it's because I write for the lyric, the, the lyrics and the melody, or, or, I mean, that's the only perspective that I can speak to. But, I mean, each song means a different thing to me as being the lyric writer. So 
whatever the song is about, I mean, I like them all, but for different reasons. I know that's a really lame answer and, you know, really PC answer, but actually it, it makes sense. You it, know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't have a favorite per se, but, um, you know, I, I, they each mean something different to me, so it's hard to pick one. With that said, when you write your lyrics, are you writing from life experiences? Are you, or what, what do you get your inform, um, inspiration from? Yeah, mostly life experience. I don't, um, I've never really been the, you know, girl meets boy type writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's worked well for Journey, and I wish I had their bank account. I'm all for that. But it's just not who I am. So most of the stuff that I write is from, um, it's usually from a, a perspective of, on, or I should say on, you know, either, you know, what's going on socially around me, um, what, you know, instances that, that's going on around me, emotions that are going on around me. It's usually written from my perspective but I try and make sure that it's accessible to anybody that's listening to it. So I've always been a fan of good lyric writing, you know, that is, you know, kind of an onion type thing where you, you listen to the melody and, oh, that's cool. You listen to the words in the chorus and, oh, that's really cool. You listen to the verse and, oh, wow, now I get it. So I don't know if I'm achieving that, but I'm trying like hell. <laughs> It, it, the album sounds great. Thanks, man. Um, one of my favorite songs is um, Peace of Mind. Yeah. My Peace of Mind. And um, I love your voice. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I like the, the high pitch sound there and then the slow parts and, and it gets heavy. It's an awesome song. Awesome yeah, song. I, I my influences uh, are, you know, very 70s based. So... Um, and, you know, I'm lucky in the fact that, again, I'm with this band and, and, you know, when Greg or Ryan, when either one come in with a roof, with a riff, the main riff of the song, when we're starting to write and Jimmy is just a great swing drummer. So once they start playing, I mean, I'm lucky in that I hear melody pretty much right out of the bat. I mean, I, I it's it's just getting it out of me and trying to write it down as soon as it comes through. And luckily that happens a lot. So awesome. Awesome. so let's talk about the CD. You, we already kind of mentioned where they could find the CD. Yeah. Um, I also heard that you may be putting it on digital platform. Yeah. Um, so in March, we, um, again, we're, we're all pretty old school. <laughs> um, but I not just me, but the band as a whole doesn't really believe in streaming. Um, I mean, I could do a whole show just about that. Um, you know, the Spotify and the Pandora. I just think you're, I did, I mean, they're ripping off the artist. So, um, even though we're not planning on buying Ferraris anytime in the next couple of weeks, um, I also don't want to give away art. I mean, it's it's art that we created. I think if you're an artist, you should be able to sell your art and make a living from it. That's that's why it's uh, that's why it's a uh, you know something you do for a living. Um, so we we're not on any streaming stuff. We wanted to release it on CD alone. Um, it's uh, 13 songs, so and it's about 60 minutes worth of music. So. I mean, it's a long CD, um, and we finally, there's been a lot of people that have asked about if we're going to do it digitally, and, um, you know, again, the, the whole corona thing kind of threw all our plans out of whack, but, uh, yeah, here's sometime in, sometime in the middle of August, if you go to kod.band, um, you'll be able to find, uh, you'll be able to download the whole record digitally. So we've had a lot of requests for it and I'm, I'm glad to be able to announce that. Yeah. What, what's your take on how music's released now? And, and it, so many independent artists out there and, yeah. you know. I, I mean, 
and this is just my opinion, but I think that, you know, everybody talks about the new model and the old model and yada, yada, yada. And, and I mean, it's definitely a new model. There's no question about it. You, 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 artists don't make money the same way they did 10, 20 years ago for sure. But that's not to say that they shouldn't. So that's why I'm so against the streaming thing. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm, us as a whole, as Kings of Dust, are still, um, I mean, I still relate to a record as a record, not as a collection of songs. I mean, we, we took a long time, you know, putting the cover together, putting, it's an eight-page booklet, I think, inside it. Um, so, I mean, we wanted it to be a record, not just a bunch of songs. And um, I'm glad that we did it that way. I, I mean, I think whether that's old school or not, whatever you want to call it, to me, that's the way it should be. I mean, I, 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 you know, everybody talks about being able to, you know, when you were 10 or 12 or whatever, opening the record and be able to sit in front of you and read the liner notes. I'm still that guy. And I, I don't, I don't believe in, um, I mean, I don't believe in it any other way, mostly because that's the way I was brought up. But I also think that that's the way you should listen to music. You should listen to music as a collection, as a whole. If you want to get a sense of a band, one song isn't going to do it. Listen to the damn record. That'll tell you who they are. And I, I think that experience bonds you with a band more than, I, I mean, I know, and this is just my perspective, um, I got big back into vinyl about two years ago um, and had all my vinyl from when I was like, you know, 14, 15. So I still have all that, thank God. Although some are missing and I'll have to talk to my son about that at some point. Um, but since then, you know, I, I, I love the hunt of finding vinyl. But the way I use iTunes is I'll, you know, I, I'll, I'll download a record on iTunes. Like, I know I want a Humble Pie record, but I'm not sure which one. So I'll download... Um, you know, a record from Humble Pie and I'll listen to it and go, no, that's not really one. And then I'll listen to Smokin' and go, yeah, yeah, that's the one I want. And then that's the one I find on vinyl. And then once I find it on vinyl, I erase it off my phone because I can't <laughs> listen to it anymore. Because yeah. it sounds so different. It does. It sounds so different. I mean, even the snaps and pops and all that stuff oh, in the album just adds to that's it. That's part of it. And we really would like to put this record on vinyl and we've talked about it a number of times the problem is that it's 60 minutes long and we would have to do a double record mm -hmm. and that's all well and good and I would love it but the cost is you know double what it would normally be so whether we pare it down to make it able to release on one record or we wind up wind up doing a double record at some point I, I'm not sure but I, I mean this record was really made for vinyl. So I'm hoping that we can get it on that one, but maybe the next one. Videos. Videos. Yes. Um, what you, I've seen that you got some lyric videos out there. Yeah, we have two of them. Concept videos coming in well, soon. Well, like I said, about? the the third the third release is supposed to be a track called "What's the Other." 
Um, we are doing or had planned on doing a full video for that. Um, we just haven't shot it yet because of all that's going on. That we've already got the concept. It's all storyboarded out. You know, everything's there, and um, it's it, once it gets done, it's it's a pretty cool video. It's I mean it's we uh, I mean you can tell if you've seen any of the videos of us talking or or introducing something. We try not to take ourselves real seriously, <laughs> so. Um, the video is in that in that vein, and it's it'll have some humor to it. And That's cool. Yeah, I, I can't wait to shoot it. It's it's a great track, um, and it'll it'll make for a cool video. So I want to talk a little bit about you. Um, oh God, <laughs> what'd you dig up? <laughs> so let, let's talk about. We're gonna go back to where you grew up. Where were you born? And well, I'm a Midwest kid. So uh, I was born in Iowa. I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska when I was uh, 12. And most of my musical career um, uh, was in Nebraska. Um, we moved to Phoenix in 94. So um, I had had a handful of, of record deals still in Nebraska before we moved here. But... Um, you know, kind of felt like we had, I, I was, I was kind of lucky in a way in that, um, there was uh, three bands in Nebraska that, um, I was lucky enough to have label deals with. So, um, I had always planned on moving to LA, you know, especially in the eighties and nineties. Um, but every time I was getting ready to move, I got a record deal with a band. <laughs> so there wasn't any really reason to move. So that's what took me until 94. Um, but, uh, you know, 94, I moved here and and uh, got in a band, uh, oddly enough, with Greg's younger brother, Kenny, who used to be in Keel, and uh, a band called Nevertheless. And uh, we slugged it out here for, you know, a number of years. And then... Uh, and then uh, that band folded, and and I didn't really do anything for, you know, musically of my own for quite some time. I kind of kind of got into um, this side of the glass and started Sound Vision in '99. So um, it wasn't till Kings of Dust that I, I mean, it's been a while since I've put out a record of you know my material. So what was it that? had that wow okay i, I want to be a singer what, what, what was the wow factor for you chicks chicks no i'm just kidding <laughs> um i mean it, but if anybody ever tells you that it's another reason <clears throat> it's not it's always chicks chicks is the reason i know guitar players always say that yeah, well because they can't say anything else that's that's the real reason of everything. You you can uh, you can ask a hundred musicians why'd you get into it? Oh, you know the the content and the you know it moved me. It was the chicks. Just let's just be honest. There's hopefully some things that happen after that, but it was the chicks. And uh, God, that sounds so lame, but it's true. So I uh, you know, but once I got into it and I started becoming a singer, um, I started out as a guitar player. To being a singer um, and realized fairly early on that um, I wasn't just doing this for the chicks that I actually wanted to make a living out of this um, so literally right out of high school I was on the road who were some of your early influences as a singer yeah as a singer. Um, the biggest one for sure or I should say the biggest two um, because they kind of cover the whole spectrum for me anyway. One is Steve Walsh from Kansas. Um, I mean, that's, I learned to sing by listening to him on records. That's where I learned. I tried to emulate everything he would do. I wish I could still. Great singer. One of my favorites for sure. Um, as far as phrasing and um, definitely lyrics, it's David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth is the best lyric writer on this planet. He doesn't get <laughs> enough he doesn't get enough credit for that part of what he does. 
But if you can find a better lyric than Blue Eyed Murder in a Size 5 Dress, I challenge you. I mean, he's just, he's the best. And at that time, he was on top of the world and on, on top of his game. And I, I, like I was saying before, I love when you, you hear a melody and it grabs you, but the deeper you go into it, into the song and kind of pick it apart, the more you find. And Van Halen was that band for me. So Awesome. Great bands, great bands. So let's look at today a little bit. I mean, those were some of your early influences. Do you have any modern influence, you know, from so many of the modern day bands? Well, definitely. I mean, I, I record a lot of them. So I, as a producer, which is my day job, <laughs> um, there's a lot of bands that I really like. I love the, mm. the, um, the kind of 70s bands that are new, um, Rival Sons, um, uh, Blackberry Smoke, um, Greta Van Fleet. I mean, I like all those bands. There's a band I just did a record for, um, very 70s-based blues power trio called Headstrom. That uh, It's a great record. Um, I like some newer-sounding stuff. There's a, a record that I'm tracking now for a band called My Own Kingdom, which is the um, singer for another great band called Adam's Fall, so, uh, and drummer from that band, actually, too. So, um, and then... You know, I, I still like recording some of the 80s sounding stuff. Um, you know, One Track Mind and, and Pasty Jenny, I did both their records. Um, another newer band that um, is going to release a, a record that I did soon is called Mistaken. Um, so there's a lot of great music out there. There really is. And I don't enjoy just one specific. Um, I mean, I... I tend to like the rock stuff better but i mean we just did a country record last week for the silver creek band so it uh but all that kind of goes back to songs i kind of treat songs as a producer the same way i do as a singer um when a band comes in it's about songs it's it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if they're country or death metal or somewhere in between it's still got to be about the song. If it's not, then it's just music, and that's not the same thing. Uh, question just popped in my mind. As a producer, okay, how how important is a producer to produce a sound? And Completely. A, and then a band just doing it on their own. Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. You know, we talked about music 10, 20 years ago and music now. I mean... Doing a, um, doing a record with a recording budget that you would have seen 20 years ago is unheard of. So smaller labels, bigger labels, whatever they are, they have cut budgets to the bone. I mean, there's, there's no extra for just about anything. But probably 90% of the stuff that you hear that is label affiliated still has a producer. There's an absolute reason for that. Um, a producer, it's not, it's not an engineer that records what you're doing. That's not a producer. An engineer tailors the songs, brings the best out of the band, pushes the things that makes that band who they are, pulls the things that can easily get overshadowed by the better things. That's what a producer does. Um, when when I go in with, a, I mean, being a singer, when I record another singer with vocals, um, you know, we, we do it pretty meticulously. Um, but we do that, I try and do that through all aspects, through, um, you know, drums, bass, guitar, horns, whatever it is. It all adds a part to the song. And that is, um, that's invaluable because you can have the same song recorded two different ways and it's got nothing to do with you know the kick drum sounds great and the bass guitar is where it is and the mix is right it it, it i mean that's all there but that kind of should be a given <laughs> i mean you you hate to have a a a song with a kick drum that sounds like it's on a paper bag so that should kind of be a given it's more about 
is the kick drum following the bass line? Is the bass line opening up where it's supposed to? Is the guitar supporting the vocal? Does the vocal have a spot to, to lend itself in? Um, does the chorus jump the way it's supposed to when it hits? Those are all things that a producer makes sure of, and a recording engineer doesn't. And that, to me, is the distinction. And my point being is that if, if record labels didn't think, if they thought that they could get away with not paying a producer for one minute, they wouldn't do it. But they don't. Because it's invaluable. It really is. You know, I've been, I've been fortunate where I've, I've had a handful of record deals throughout my career. And the producing style, if that's what you want to call it, um, that I bring bands in with is, um, is based on who I've worked with. Um, some of them I didn't like, and some of them I did. Um, but the ones that I worked with that I didn't like, I probably learned more out of as a producer because it's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's a good point. That was, going to, that was one of the questions I was going to ask is, how do you deal with people that don't, that you headstrong with? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really ever get into that. I, I mean, I shouldn't say ever, but that's not my style. I mean, I, there are some producers that will, that will bring a band in and they have a preconceived notion about what you're supposed to sound like. And most of that preconceived notion is on what they've done in the past. They have a certain sound, and they're kind of trying to fit you into their box. Um, those aren't the producers that I got along with. Um, you know, most of the time I was on that side of the glass. You know, I was touring with that band. You're not going to tell me how I'm supposed to sound. I know this band inside and out. I live it, breathe it. I eat with these idiots. I know exactly what they're supposed to be doing and what they're not. And you're not going to presume to tell me what I'm supposed to sound like or what my guitars, my guitar player's tone is supposed to be. I know it. I hear it every night. So that's not the kind of producer I am. I'm more the kind of guy that will sit down, will listen to a track, and it's not big things. It's a bunch of little ones. It's things, like I said, about, um, you know, is the, is the bass player following the kick drum? Is the pattern, is the pattern accenting the vocal? Is the guitar player weaving something through it where it's it's got a melody? You know, things like that are to me what a producer should do. They shouldn't be changing the verse to the chorus and the chorus to the bridge and and blah 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 blah. That's not my idea. You're not changing the band per se. You just want I'm to just, help bring the fuller sound. Just, what are some of the big bands you've been in? I know you've been in the Red Dragon Cartel. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was there for a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> um, it's a long story, but um, yeah, I was. Um, I auditioned for uh, Jakey Lee's Red Dragon Cartel, and it's you know Jakey Lee is you know Bark at the Moon, Ozzy's guitar player, and a phenomenal guitar player. I mean, he is. We're still talking about him for a reason. He is. He is who he is for a reason. He is without a doubt, one of the best guitar players I've played with. He's, he's, he's got the it, whatever it is. Yeah. And I was so happy to be a part of that. Um, it didn't work out, um, um, but it all worked out the way it was supposed to. So, um, Did you get an album with Did you record I didn't. No. Um, the, the first record had come out. Um, Darren James Smith was their first singer. Um, and then I took over for him. And then some things didn't work out, and, and uh, they wound up going back to Darren, um, which is where they should have been to begin with, and that's okay. Um, I'm friends with Darren still. So, um, uh, and, But when I started in the band, when I was f first got the gig, Greg was still the bass player. So that was a big thing for me. Um, and then Greg had to drop out because he got sick. And that kind of changed things for me a little bit. Um, it was still great playing with Jake. I loved my time with Red Dragon Cartel. Um, the shows were great every night. Um, I was really happy to be a part of that and to get to be able to play with Jake. But I am 
more than happy to have a record out with Kings of Dust, for sure. Because this is, you know, in that situation, I mean, you're 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 a cover singer. I mean, I didn't get to do a record, so, um, you know, it, fortunately, most of the singers that I was com- covering were my favorite singers, being you know Ray from Badlands and singing that Badlands stuff with Jake was, I mean, that's that's bucket list stuff. <laughs> and Jake Jake was with Badlands too, right? Absolutely, yeah. he was. Yeah. yeah. So being able to sing High Wire and Dreams in the Dark and you know with Jake. And I could be singing and look over and there's Jake. That That's pretty cool. Yeah. But I get the same feeling because Greg was also in Badlands. And looking over and saying Greg's a pretty cool thing too. Um, I really like playing with uh, with Ryan and Jimmy as well. This band is just what it's... It's a great situation because I get to do um, my lyrics, my melody, my music with a bunch of guys that I'd probably be hanging around with anyway. So we could probably say Kings of Dust is a super group. <laughs> sure. <Okay>. <laughs> I just heard a little bit about this, but you had a little stint with Leather Wolf. I did. Yeah. I did. Back in uh, 2000 or something. Um, they, uh, they were kind of, it was kind of their comeback or whatever. And um, they were getting ready to make a record. They had had, most of the music tracked. I flew to LA and did some recording with them. Um, came back and everything was kind of on hold until they got things figured out. And um, you know, who to release it? Excuse me, who to release it with? How to release it? You know. Um, but in that time period, they got their original singer back. And again, if if you're the guy on the first record, you should be the guy on the second. So. Um, or the third or the fifth or whatever the case may be. So, and, you know, especially a band like Leather Wolf, I'm sure, you know, when when you go out and you start promoting gigs, if it's the original core band, they make more money. So I got it. It was okay. I, Again, I, I don't, it's the music business. I, I get both sides of it. Um, I had a great time in my short time with Leather Wolf, but, Again, I'm really glad how everything's turned out. So, <laughs> so I was reading a thread on. It was an older thread, obviously, and it was um, about you joining Red Dragon Cartel. Mm-hmm. And I just started reading the comments. You know, I like to read the comments because sometimes you learn some things. And one comment said that your '80s band was a band called Manila Thrills. Yeah. So first band I had a record deal with actually, yeah. So that got me interested. I I went and looked for some music and I found some and it was pretty cool. Thank you. Pretty cool stuff. That was a good band too. That was yeah. a that was an interesting. I mean, it was a band of the time. This was you know I think we started in eighty seven, and we broke up in probably ninety one something like that. So. We were there for a while, um, lots of touring. I mean, we went all over this country. sound to yeah them. and I mean you know as you would expect um, pretty skid row Queens yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but a really good band actually the drummer is in pelvic meatloaf here in town oh. John Ogle um, great band um, I learned so much in that band because you know it's your first record deal we uh, the guy that produced it was the guy that produced uh, Tora Tora back in the day um, uh, and he also just did a Stone Sour record not too long ago. Um, a guy named Tom Tapman, who's still one of my, I mean, I call him once or twice a year and pick his brain. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot from that band. It was, uh, it was actually really weird being on the road with Red Dragon Cartel and have people come up and have 
Manila Thrills things that they want me to sign. <laughs> it's like, all right, that's cool. Yeah, that is. Yeah. That's really cool. When I first met you, I went to go take pictures of, um, I don't know, Ozzy Tribute Band. Mm -hmm. and oh, that's right. I don't remember if you were opening or they were opening, because I know you guys switch back and forth we every did. time. Yeah, good friends of ours. Yeah. And um, you got a mutual guitarist. Mutual guitar player. Yeah. And yep. um, so I just, I was shooting for them, but I just thought I'd take some pictures, and um, that's how we got to talking. That's and right. Meet and so what do you think about the Arizona local scene out here when it was happening? <laughs> yeah, when it was. Um, I, I mean, again, I, I record a lot of bands from Arizona um, and from other states as well. Um, but the scene here is always, you know, it's like any other scene. It's up and down. Um, you know, right now it's a little down for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but there's some great bands in this town. There always has been. I mean... You know, in the in the early two thousands, I was um, I was an on air on uh, KEDJ The Edge, if you remember that station, mm -hmm. the alternative station, and I was the local music director there for almost three years. So it gave uh, and afforded me the ability to see a lot of bands because I was putting them on the air and on 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 radio, and um, there was a great scene back then. I mean, it. I don't know if it's been that good sense um that may just be me saying talking about it um i mean there is a lot of bands around here that are really good um it's just harder and harder to make a living at it yeah. you know so it's uh it it's um it's a different thing than it used to be um that being said i also um for the last 16 years i've worked with alice cooper and done uh, uh, Taste of Christmas Pudding CD along with his Christmas Pudding concert and all that. And so again, it, it affords me the opportunity to be able to see some great bands. Um, you know, there's some, some, some really good bands that have come up through those ranks and done pretty well. Um, unfortunately, and again, we do a whole segment on this, so stop me. <laughs> but the the support system in this town for local music is so horrible. Oh, really? It always has been. It's New Times, and I'm just going to say this, so if you work for New Times, I'm sorry, but they are the devil. <laughs> they don't support local music. They don't like local music. The music that they do like is so far down the list of stuff that people actually listen to, it's unbelievable. The only stuff they really report on is is negative stuff, and that's that doesn't do a community any good. There's no real radio stations that that promote anything local anymore, um, but there's still a lot of good bands. So it, it's uh, there's kind of a disconnect. I'm hoping that that bridge gets built again. In all the bands I've ever been in, no matter who we've toured with, I mean I don't go up if I'm opening for a national band. I don't go up to play a good show. I go up to blow them off the stage. That's my intent. Every time. Every time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's always my intent. And I think that's a different thing. You know, that is still more... But, you know, but then when I leave the stage, I'm cheering them on. Yeah. So that's a different thing. And I, I think there's, there's a balance of both. I think this town is, has always um, been a little bit here and there. I mean, I know when I moved here in 94, um, you know, I, I was in a, a really popular band. Um, you know, we were signed and, and we toured all through the Midwest and very popular in the Midwest. And we actually could put a show on and put a tour on and make some money. I mean, that, that's... It's an unheard of concept in war. Mm -hmm. And when I moved here, um, it was a bit of a culture shock. I mean, I got in a, in a band that was, um, you know, made up of a lot of, a lot of uh, guys that had, you know, been there, done that, and ready to do it again. You know, 
Kenny from Keel and and uh, Donnie had played in two cities. And so there it was a, I don't know if you'd call it a super group, but it was a super local group. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a really good band. Um, and we were well received, but it, you know, when you get eight bands on a bill and you see the crowd switch every time a band switches, yeah, that. that's really disappointing because that's not, that's not camaraderie. That when you see the bands leaving after their set, that's not camaraderie. That's that's not even cool. That's uncool. You should be if you want to be a part of the scene. Be a part of the scene. Do something for it. Don't expect that it's all going to come to you, and think that you don't have to do anything to reciprocate that. So that's kind of my feeling. I, I've seen both. I've seen where I see a lot of. People from other bands coming out, checking out other bands, and and you and see that, and that's exciting to me. You, you see that, like I said, it kind of ebbs and flows. Yeah. Um, you know, in in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, when you know the Gin Blossoms and Workshop, and and I mean there was all those bands. You know, the Tempe sound. All those guys were friends, and it made a better scene. Um, in the 80s when you had Lynch Mob and Badlands and uh, Judas Priest and all those guys hanging out at the Mason Jar, it was a better scene. So um, that's one of the things I love about the Alice Cooper thing that I do is when you, you know, when we go through that competition um, to see who's going to, you know, win a spot to play with Alice, which is a huge deal, um, you see bands that are helping each other and you know, throughout the competition, they make friendships, and that's great. I mean, that's the way it should work. It, it is the way it should work. Um, not everybody's going to make it. Not everybody's going to go on to the next level. Um, most won't. But the reason that you don't shouldn't be because, you know, there's no camaraderie in your scene. Mm-hmm. That, that should be the last reason. Are there any other musicians or anybody that you would like to collaborate with something that sticks out? Well, I mean, as a producer, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that most of the bands that I work with, you know, I get to pick and choose a little bit. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, being a producer is all that I do. I don't sell real estate during the day or something like that. I mean, I'm here six, seven days a week. So um, most of the bands that come in, I'm interested in working with on one level or level or another, um, and I am confident enough in my ability as a producer to know that when they leave, they've got a better record than what they thought they would have when they came in. Um, as a singer, um, again, I've been really fortunate. I've played with some great bands, some really great next level musicians. Um, I am so happy with Kings of Dust where I am now. Um, the band is, is you know, it, it, both as individuals, as people, and as musicians, they are equally enjoyable. <laughs> um, it's a, you know, it's a fun band to be in, but it also... Everybody takes their, their work seriously, and there's, I mean, there really isn't any, uh, you know, there's usually when you when you show up for rehearsal, there's always one link in the chain. <laughs> there's always one guy that, you know, didn't do his homework, and, you know, didn't learn the part, and didn't work on the song, and, I mean, that's that's not really the case with this band. Um, it, it Everybody in the band pulls their weight. Um, it's it's been pretty refreshing, at least, especially at this stage of my career where I'm not 25 anymore, to not have a fight every time I walk into rehearsal and be able to, like I said, work seven songs into the next record. And they're really cool. They're really cool. Awesome. I can't wait for the next record. Awesome. Is there any advice you could give to new mus- musicians or even people that have been around for a while, any good advice that you could give to someone? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, 
it's coming for me, so take it from a, with a grain of salt. <laughs> I don't know everything. I don't even begin to know everything. But there is a couple things I know for sure. You gotta play with people that are better than you. If you've got a drummer that is trying to keep up, get a better drummer. Play with people better than you, it will make you better. Always put your best foot forward. If you're gonna do something, do it right. Don't do it wrong. I see bands all the time as on this side of the class. That, oh yeah, we just put something up on Facebook, you know, because we wanted to know what, you know, have people hear what we sound like. Well, that's not what you sound like. This sounds like crap. Do you sound like crap? That's not what you sound like. So go in and do it right, because that's what you should be doing is putting your best foot forward. People don't listen through bad recordings to hear a good band. They just think it's a bad band. That's, there's, there's no disconnect between the two. So just do it right. Whether it's for me or somebody else, just for God's sakes, do it right. But find somebody that, that you can put in your corner to make a better record. Because the, the doors that that opens is everything. You can have great promotion. You can have a great band. You can have everything that you need, but if you don't have something that I can listen to after I walk out of the venue seeing you, you're dead. You're not going anywhere. It's, I, can't, I can't pass it on to you. I can't pass it on to anybody because if I tell you, hey, there's this band I just heard the other night and they were great and you know, here's what they sound like and it's some horrible recording, you don't catch on. You don't get it. Exactly. You didn't see him live. So, but if I play something that is great and really makes the band sound like who they are, well, now you're excited about it and you you want to go see them. You want to go see them live, even if it's with a mask on. <laughs> I'm really excited about Kings of Dust and Me I'm too. so looking forward to seeing them live. Me too. <laughs> God, I mean, that's, uh, that's where we were all just chomping at the bit to go take this band out live. I mean, it, I, I can't stress enough that I'm, we were just really excited about going and playing live and be able to, to bring a whole different experience to the record. And, yeah, damn it. Well, when you do, you look me up, huh? I want to do some pictures for sure. Hopefully it'll be soon, but uh, but now we'll have two records to play. So before we finish up here, is there anything you'd like to say? Anything that's on your mind? Anything that maybe um, we missed? I thank you for doing this. I completely appreciate it. Um, you know, having the opportunity to talk about a a project that I'm in is not something I've been able to do for a while. And I'm happy that this is the project. Um, also, um, you know, if, if you don't have the record, go buy the record. It's at, uh, it should be at most, uh, you said you couldn't find it at Zia, but it might have been that store or ask for it. Um, we had kind of a problem with, uh, you know, when this, as I'm sure we weren't the only ones. We actually sold out of our first, um, our first in-store you know, a couple copies that all the stores had pretty quickly, but it took forever to get them restocked. But hopefully now they're restocked and you can go out and buy the record. But if uh, if you'd rather have it on digital, which a lot of people have been asking about, and uh, I'm happy to say that, you know, here, like I said, sometime in the middle of, uh, of August, we should have it on kod.band, and you can pick it up there. Well, Michael, we thank you very much, and... Um... On behalf of Dylan Kinder and Penny Freeman and myself, this was a blast. You know, I'm I feel privileged to be able to interview someone of your <laughs> your, your statue here. You I know. appreciate that, man. That's well. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, boy. Look, that's a faux pas right there. <laughs>